I'm playing tour guide today in this Shanghai laneway full of character and have a look at this. They're getting the meals ready for the day here in this restaurant, washing the meat in the sink. This gentleman here is leading out Ni Hao. He's leading out all the dough for the... Hello, hello, how are you? You're making the noodles for the day. Fantastic. This is certainly the traditional view of cuisine in this city, traditional Chinese cuisine. But the thing that we found here is that the appetites are changing very heavily. As the middle class rises, there's an enormous appetite for fine food, fine Western food. Now, I've met a master chef here called David Laris. He's an Australian. He's a sort of a rock star around here, and his restaurants have been incredibly successful. I'm about to sit down as he cooks me an absolute gastronomic delight. Okay. Well, this looks fantastic. So what have we got today? So we've got a, a little tasting menu. I mean, in this room, we normally do anywhere from 12 to 14, 16 courses, depending on, on the day or how I feel. Um, but min minimum, minimum 10. This is all very Western and sophisticated. Yeah, it's I mean, yeah, Western, there's a huge presence of Western dining in China um, and in Shanghai in particular, say Shanghai and Beijing predominantly. Um, and fine, finer dining definitely exists in a, in a very big way. It's, uh, it's become a long way and I've been here at the forefront of the fine dining end and there's some more you know, cutting edge cuisine for 10 years and I've seen it go from people looking at what I was doing just not getting it at all you know and, and you know thinking to myself I've made a mistake by coming you know to it becoming like an award an award-winning restaurants and, and it being full of Chinese uh, and one thing we've tracked is the growth in the Chinese consumer versus the Western cons consumer and it's it's definitely now over 50 percent of people are towards a Chinese market so it's changed quite yeah amazing. absolutely it's yeah. been a huge change and what is that? Is that the rise of this aspirational middle class that we keep hearing about here? Or? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have we, we have the wealthy affluent Chinese who sort of lead the market. I mean, they're they're they're, they're it's very strong in terms of you know having travel and so on. But then, yeah, it's all about this affluent middle class that that some can afford the higher end, but a tremendous growth of the middle class within the Western restaurants, which have become destination things like that. that, that in the West, we might consider as sort of everyday concepts. Um, the, the Chinese middle class consumer is now coming and trying them as a special night out. But how rapidly is it growing? You must see it change almost. Every Every day. I don't think anyone's ever seen anything like this in, the hum in human history is the growth of a city like Shanghai and China in general. It's the largest urbanization program ever. The Romans and Greeks didn't come close. And unfortunately, I'm half Greek, so I have to give that one up. <laughs> <laughs> so you're surprised every day when you see the growth yeah. of China, aren't you? You can see I'm excited. You know, I, yeah. I've been here 10 years and my excitement hasn't got any less. In fact, it's increasing. Yeah. You know, I get up every day and I'm like, wow, what, what, what surprises you know, in store for me today? Um, a lot of problems as well, a lot of challenges, but I think if you're the kind of person who enjoys challenges and you like to think on your feet, this is, this is a gold mine for, for you. Know? And I've, I've been doing, I mean, I've started business, I've started companies here, I've had failures, I've had successes, and I get up every day though and I'm like, you know what, today's a new day and there's going to be another deal out there and there's going to be more things that are going to happen and that keeps you going. And that energy for an entrepreneur or for anyone who's got a spirit of adventure, it's what, it's what drives you and this city is full of people like that. Thank you very much. And what do we have here? So here, here we have a little quail and chestnut soup with a mustard jelly. Okay. Well, it looks absolutely delightful. I hope you like the level of refinement and so on that we're doing here. Mm. And, uh, I get if I don't do it, if I don't do it right, I get a lot of complaints from the Chinese customers. They come to expect a certain level. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, they travel there. They're exposed to food. You know, you mm. can't just cheat. <laughs> you have to yeah. do it right. So don't tell me they send it back. Not here. No. <laughs> <laughs> some would be surprised to hear you say that it's easier to do business in China. I've got some mates who own restaurant groups back home. I won't say you know, but they, they tell me there's a lot of challenges and a lot of challenges that I don't confront. I prob probably confront other challenges, um, but I've been able to move. I must say, you know, there's the perception, the misperception, I think about succeeding in China or doing business in China. Yes, there are a lot of problems. Yes, there's a lot of stuff you have to read between the lines and work it out for yourself. There's not a lot of clear, defined rules on how you do things or how you get things done, but there's an acceptance and an openness that just says, just do it, man, just go and do it, mm -hmm. you know? There's a lot less, like, success bashing here, you know? If you have the spirit to do so, people get behind you rather than bash you, you know? And we always, we have that tall poppy syndrome that we all have to deal with back home sometimes. I don't see it here. You know, it just doesn't exist. It's, it's interesting because you're embracing what many people fear, and that is the rise and the strength of 
China and it being an economic superpower. Yeah, I think embrace it. Don't don't fight against it. And there's no evil agenda. I think it's just all about you know a growth of a country. You ever think you'd be part of a revolution? <laughs> we don't use the revolution very often. No. <laughs> Culturally sensitive, but I mean that's what we're talking about, isn't it? It's an economic revolution and it's a cultural revolution in regards to you know um, the way that the, the the movement is shifting and the way that people are thinking. I mean. You know, I think, I think the everyday Chinese person is just as normal as any other person on the planet. They have the same, you know, desires, the same wishes, the same feelings, you know, they love their family the same way everyone else does. And I think it's about looking at, you know, the commonness between human beings mm. and not the differences so much. Because when you boil it down and you're actually able to interact one to one, you realize actually that, every, you know, we're, we're all the same, you know. Um, and I, I try to embrace that philosophically as well. It's a good way to do it. Yeah, it's your, it's your <laughs> you have to. Yeah. So this is um, an onion puree with um, mushrooms, with, with local mushrooms, and a mascarpone cheese, a little, and carrots that have been uh, braised in, uh, in truffle, and we have a little bit of olive oil powder yeah. on top. So this is what's great about this is like all these ingredients, apart from the mascarpone, are from China. So we are able to find truffles here, although they're not the best truffles in the world, I must admit. Um, we can find like quite a gourmet mushrooms and yeah. these guys who are growing them and finding them up in North China and bringing them to us. So yeah. it, it's, it's, it's quite, quite cool. James Packer is a huge advocate of uh, selling to the Chinese and bringing the middle class to Australia. Do it. <laughs> mostly to attend his casinos. But he says, we, you know, we cannot underestimate the size of this Chinese middle class and, and their appetite for the things that we do very well in Australia. Yeah, and everything we do, don't forget, is exotic. You know, we may come here and find the Chinese market exotic. It's the same way the other way around. You know, everything that's in Australia is exotic to, to everyday Chinese person. So we should exploit that. And we have, we have a lot of cool stuff. I mean, we're a pretty crazy place. You know, yeah. we can go out back. We've got all this, I mean, one of the most beautiful countries on the planet. So we should definitely do more. And I, you know, and I think, you know, obviously Packer's right. I mean, they do like a flutter. So if we can get them, get them through the casino, fair enough. And get them the good food as well. <laughs> yeah, and, so, and look, look at the food we have in Australia. Yeah. I mean, what, how many... Awesome chefs and awesome wrestlers do we have? I think Australia is one of the greatest food food cities, on, or food countries, I should say, on the planet. What an awesome market we have! So, food tourism should we be do investing it. more in that? Yes, I think that's a that's a that's a big market. Yeah. You know, le leisure, food, you know, and and, and and that sort of nature we have. You've got to remember as well, Chinese don't have access to nature the way we do. If you whatever, even if you, even if you're a city boy like me, I mean, I was in the mountains, you know every other weekend, right? Mm. Um, to me, being able to access the mountains and have access to this incredible like landscape is something that doesn't exist here. You have to make it a real effort. If you're a Shanghai person living in one of the flattest places on the planet, below sea level, look around. Do you see any mountains? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so we have the Blue Mountains right there in Sydney. You can go to Sydney and then see the mountains. So I think we should, we should take more advantage of that. So perhaps these Chinese mega cities could present Australia with an amazing opportunity. I think so. They're going to want to get out of them. Yeah. And come and enjoy our backyard. Fresh air, awesome food, you know, great people. We just got to remember to be friendly. Because <laughs> they're, they're positive here, you're saying. Absolutely, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Here, everyone's upbeat about what's going on. Mm. You know, I think you, you can speak to anybody in, this, in, a, in a city like, like, like a, you know, as you say, a mega city like Shanghai. It doesn't matter what they're doing. They could be washing pots. They could be cleaning the street. They're going, I have a chance. You know, I have as good a chance as anybody else in this, in this market. If I'm smart enough and I'm willing to work hard enough, I can, I can do more. I, I, I liken it to, to what it must have been to be like in the U.S. in their first boom, you know, when all these you know, immigrants were coming in and it was just, you know, being an entrepreneur was at the heart and soul of what built America, right, to being this, this, the strongest economy on the planet. So that's what it feels like here. You know, you can, you can imagine it, you can dream it, you can fund, find the funding and you can do it. Doesn't mean you won't file five, five, five times, yeah. you know, in the process of doing it. Yeah. But if you're resilient enough and your idea is strong enough, and you believe you, this is a this is a good place to do it. Um, there's an appetite for investment. There's an appetite for new ideas. We're talking about the land of opportunity. Absolutely, it is. It is at the moment. I really feel it is. You know, um, and you know, you have, like I said, you have to you have to be resilient. You have to you have to be able to persevere. But it is it is a land of opportunity.